Hello everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about the National LGBTI Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Strategy. Uh, today's a little bit of a special webinar in our usual Network Mind Out series. Um, and so we, today we have myself, uh, Sally Morris, and my colleague Ross Jacobs uh, here talking about the strategy. Um, I'm the uh, National LGBTI, um, sorry, I'm the, the coordinator of the National Mind Out Project, which is a National LGBTI Mental Health uh, and Suicide Prevention Project. And Ross, could you just introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ross Jacobs. I'm the um, National Coordinator of Clinical Practice at the Q Life Project, which is, um, we'll explain the Alliance Projects to you all uh, in a few minutes, but I also participate in the Mind Out Project. And, uh, working with the strategy on Sally uh, has been a big chunk of our work over the last seven years. Awesome. Um, so just before we kick off, I always just like to double check that everyone can see and hear us okay. So on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, there's a little text box. So if you can see and hear us okay, can um, people just type a little message that that um, you, you can hear us? Um, beautiful, getting some messages through, that's lovely. Um, and also before we like to, to begin our webinars, we like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we're uh, gathering uh, today um, in online land. So I'm actually, I'm in, in Brisbane um, and Ross is actually in Sydney. So we're on, um, and, and we have particip participants from all across Australia. So I'd just like to acknowledge the land on which all of us are, are gathering here today. Um, and in Alliance tradition, we also like to acknowledge uh, LGBTI people who have paved the way uh, historically for us to be where we are today and, and, and producing the type of work that we're doing. Um, okay, so just to kick off for, for today's webinar, um, just to, I guess, remind people about the, the National LGBTI Health Alliance um, as a, we're a national peak body um, supporting uh, health and wellbeing programs that focused on LGBTI people. Um, and in our work, we acknowledge that people's genders, sexualities, relationships and bodies um, has an impact on people's life, health and wellbeing. Um, the Alliance has a few different programs and uh, you're probably most familiar with myself with the Mind Out Project, which is a national LGBTI mental health and suicide prevention project. Primarily, we look at increasing the capacity of what we deem mainstream uh, services to better support and to be more inclusive of LGBTI populations. Um, and I'll get uh, Ross to reflect a little bit about Q Life and Super, Super Rainbow. Uh, sure. So uh, I'm just aware of sound too. Someone's saying my sound was fading in and out. So if that happens again, just let us know in that chat box. But uh, from my end, it does all seem to be coming through pretty clear. So um, like I say, let, let us know if that's happening. But otherwise, um, the Q Life Project, which is where I spend a lot of my working time, um, came about about three years ago, which uh, included LGBTI populations in an existing stream of um, government initiative called the Teleweb, uh, the Telehealth Initiative. So uh, that's to do with providing mental health uh, services uh, to uh, populations that don't necessarily have access to them face and face uh, face to face. So it's using technology like telephone and web chat, which is what we do at QLife, but other teleweb partners do things like online forums and online self-guided tool, uh, tools for mental health. So um, QLife came about three years ago, so after Mind Out. Uh, and then the other main project uh, from the Health Alliance's point of view is the Silver Rainbow Project. So it's the newest of the three. And it came about... Um, uh, through uh, sector reform, let's call it, for the aged care um, sector. And that's got to do with helping providers of aged care settings and beds and services to get better at LGBTI populations and understand how for older people there are some really critical issues that need to be addressed and the government now says under the law they must be addressed. Uh, which really does lead us to what we're talking about today because what both Sally and I and all of us here at the Alliance saw was that Silver Rainbow was aided so much in its work because it had an underpinning framework that government signed up to in terms of an aged care strategy specific for LGBTI people, which really got us talking about what we needed in a particular space. And so that really leads on to, I guess, the, the conversation that we're having today. So 
last week we uh, officially launched this strategy um, and we had a, a, an online webinar that was launching it yesterday. <laughs> Thanks, Doris. Um, and, and, but today we really wanted to more just have a conversation about the content. Um, we're not yet really going to be delving into implementation per se. I guess today we really just wanted to go through this page by page um, and describe our thinking behind um, the strategy and, and what are some of the key elements to it. And, and I guess really start to have um, uh, everyone start pondering about what is what is your role in implementing this strategy. Uh, there will be a whole range of other uh, implementation uh, things that we will be doing as well. So other webinars, other online training and things like that uh, around implementation. This is so really the first taster, I guess, of delving into this strategy in more depth. Um, so Ross and I are sort of going to be talking back and forth uh, through this. Um, primarily, Ross and I sort of uh, led on the development of this document and worked really closely with um, Alliance Working Groups and other programs to pull this together. So we've actually sort of been living and breathing this document for a while. So it's actually really exciting for us to share this with you. Um, and so, so today, um, if people have any questions around the strategy, um, you can type your questions in the text box in the lower left hand side. Mindful, we, we might not be able to answer all of them now. We might, um, there might be some answers that might be better suited to some of the implementation tasks we're going to be doing in the future. But um, yeah, please, and, please and also very mindful that today is hopefully a conversation. So if you guys would want to contribute to that in terms of content, please feel free to jump in. Uh, and as Sally's saying, the implementation questions are yet to be answered and uh, they really do have to do with each of your organisations interacting with this document. So today we're, we're walking you through what's in it and from now and over the next few months is when we'll really do the, the integration stuff. Right. Cool. So, so essentially, I guess what what this document is. So, this document is a strategy that, for us, it really sets out an agenda for national coordinated action um, and a commitment to the prevention of ill health and suicide for LGBTI peoples uh, and communities. And but it, and it does this by really identifying what are the gaps in intervention and prevention um, initiatives and it also by identifying what does effective mental health and suicide prevention strategies for LGBTI people look like in an Australian context. Um, so it's very much, it's, it's, a, it's an overarching um, document and, and it, it really looks at the breadth of uh, across promotion, prevention, intervention, treatment and maintenance um, and, and really looking at what can we do to interrupt the structural factors that contribute to poor mental health um, and risk of suicide for LGBTI people and communities? Um, and this is actually something that's really probably been quite missing from the LGBTI mental health space. Um, Mindout's been working in LGBTI mental health suicide prevention officially since 2011. Uh, and a lot of our work has been working with organisations who do great mental health work and in that space, we've been very much aware that there's been a lot of interest in LGBTI people and organisations asking the question. Um, sorry, someone saying that my phone keeps hitting something. I'm just putting my necklace behind my T-shirt to see whether that might help because that might have been what might be knocking it. Um, hopefully that's better. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry about that. I tend to fiddle with my necklace too. So, um, I guess and, and in our work with um, organisations, we'll constantly hear an organisation saying, I want to do this work better, but we don't really know how to do that. Um, and, and there was this really this desire for a guide or a framework or what are the rules, how do we do this? Um, and that really started us lean towards the conversation about we needed this overarching strategy. And as Ross mentioned, uh, observing what had happened in the ageing age care space um, and how having a national LGBTI ageing age care strategy really did create significant change in, in how people did work on the ground in that sector. Um, so that's really what we were trying to, work, to achieve with the development of the strategy. Um, one of the key, folk, I guess, quite important focus for us is this actually strategy looks at both mental health um, mental illness and suicide. Um, and even though um, not all people who are vulnerable to suicide have poor mental health and not all people with mental illness will, um, will uh, think or contemplate or attempt suicide, but there actually are some 
factors that sit across both mental illness and suicide that are related um, and they're strongly linked and, and they're both really impacted by a range of shared um, circumstances and and so consequently the solutions also need to overlap those risk areas as well. Um, so these things can be like uh, stressful life, life events, um, uh, you know, predisposing risk factors um, and, and I guess we're going to talk a little bit more about about that but I think that's probably one a quite a unique aspect of this strategy that does look at both mental illness and suicide whereas many strategies um, in our sector will either look at one or the other and, and sometimes they don't talk to each other. Um, so for, for us it was really important that the strategy looked at both but really recognising that there are different needs and different um, solutions for suicide as there is for mental illness. So I'm going to hand over to Ross I think. Yep, yep. thanks Kelly. Yep. Uh, no problem. <laughs> Um, as you guys will notice, today's presentation will sort of be flipping between um, both Shelley and I speaking when it comes to the slides. But uh, if you've got questions, for either of us, we can it. so um, really the purpose of the document that we're talking about, um, Sally laid out there nicely in terms of a perceived need for it, and the fact that whenever we did see LGBTI people mentioned in national strategies. Um, it was a very simple mention of a single line and very little follow through. So um, what we have tried to do in this document is um, provide the framework for a strategic response to what we know is much higher rates of poor mental health and uh, suicide for LGBTI people. So uh, what we know is that um, coordinated responses where we're all on the same page and we're all pulling in the same direction is a really important um, thing to achieve because you shouldn't have different responses to the same population if you're in a different part of the country. So uh, we're really looking at making sure that there's some leadership in this space. Um, we're trying to set an agenda for that coordinated action. So really it's all well and good for us here at the Alliance and at Mindout and at QLife and you know other agencies across the country that are doing uh, frontline work with LGBTI people but it's another thing for uh, agencies across the board to put up their hand and commit uh, to this coordinated action. So that's really what um, we'll be walking you guys through later on in today's webinar. So we're hoping that um, what the document achieves is um, a concept of how to frame and promote the mental health and wellbeing of LGBTI people um, by like I'm saying, not just people that are already doing the work with LGBTI people, but for mainstream providers of mental health services and suicide prevention services as well. And uh, finally, we'll be walking you all through to uh, a concept of commitment to the goals of this document and how we can together articulate and achieve those. So as you can see, it's, it's quite um, ambitious in scope, uh, but the purpose of this document was deliberately so uh, because it's been a, a long overdue commitment and a long overdue exploration of what um, poor mental health and suicide prevention means for LGBTI people. Um, so also with the audience, um, this strategy we, we see as having a, a, a really broad audience. Um, we obviously, our LGBTI community organisations, LGBTI people and communities play a big role as do mental health services and suicide prevention programs. But it's also much broader than that. Like we're also talking to uh, policy makers and researchers, our primary health networks, national, state and local government, but also to um, other sectors that are relevant to the solution to mental health and suicide prevention. So things that some um, health, education, housing, um, income, advocacy, media, like these, uh, all these other sectors interrelate and create and support the, 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 the factors that either support mental ill health or, or mental health. Um, and, and so we didn't see this as purely a strategy that for the health department to implement, we see this as a sector-wide um, and community-wide, a really broad strategy that requires multiple players to work collaboratively and, and, be, and coordinated together to implement this. Um, so all of that hopefully gives you guys a sense of the context in which we uh, have developed this document. Uh, but above and beyond that, 
um, really what you'll see in the document is that it's um, very broad in who it's talking to and how it's talking about the issues contained in it. So specifically mental health and suicide prevention. This is not necessarily a targeted document for one population or for one kind of work. It's a much broader umbrella document than that. Um, and, it's, and it's deliberately so because we have drawn from multiple uh, existing um, uh, studies or multiple existing data sets, which really demonstrates uh, in black and white that LGBTI populations have a much poorer um, rate of poor mental health than the Australian population as a whole. So what we know from all of those studies is that uh, LGBTI people experience uh, worse rates of depression and anxiety in particular, but also of uh, the more, um, uh, let's say, uh, diagnosable mental health conditions in terms of, um, you know, uh, your conditions that require ongoing care within a medical context. So. Going along with that, we also see much elevated rates of suicide and self-harm for LGBTI people. And this context we have developed in the context of needing to piece some of this together ourselves, because when you do take a look at the research base that we have, some of it isn't from Australia, some of it is from overseas. But what we've tried to do is to draw on all of the Australian uh, studies that we could. And to do so meant that we're combining some studies that look at only gay and lesbian people, some studies that only look at transgender people, some studies that combine a different um, group of ages in terms of participants than other studies. So it's been a challenge to draw together all of the statistics into a single site, but really that's what underpins this document. What we do know is going on out there in Australia. And as we'll talk about a bit later, that data context is a really important kit of consideration for the work moving forward because uh, for Sally and I to have to do that work and Sally spent a lot of time reading these documents and pulling them together, um, that's not an easy data context for people in terms of how to intervene if you're not already an expert. So that really was the starting place for how we uh, uh, considered this work, what we thought was required, and what the studies were telling us was required. So um, that context that I've just described in terms of poorer mental health outcomes for LGBTI people, uh, I say this time and time again every time I'm talking, particularly to mainstream providers of services, uh, but also to uh, within population providers, is that that context isn't as a result of being LGBTI. That context of poorer mental health and of uh, higher rates of suicide um, is about the context in which LGBTI people live and about higher rates of discrimination and prejudice and lived experience of stress that goes along with uh, being an LGBTI person in Australia. And that's where the Q Life Project really comes into play because uh, for those of you not familiar with it, we work uh, um, primarily with LGBTI people across the telephone and across uh, web chat technologies where people tell us about their lived experience. And it was really important for both Sally and myself to bring some of that lived experience into sharp focus in this document. And that doesn't mean that we have explored the stories of individuals, but we really think it's vital that the individual and the lived experience of the individual Come, uh, become central to any kind of intervention when it comes to a strategic LGBTI mental health and suicide response. And so actually, just as um, reflecting upon that, that, that context about what we do know in research has actually, I think, has, a, has, a, had, a, has had a direct relation to about the level of visibility or rather invisibility of LGBTI population in national mental health and suicide prevention strategies and policies. Um, and as Ross sort of said, we actually, we spent a long time digging through documents and resources and really trying to understand, well, what is the current climate at the moment? What level of inclusion do we have for LGBTI populations within a national 
um, framework. Um, and certainly what we did find uh, was that actually LGBTI populations were very invisible um, in, so in mental health and suicide prevention strategies, policies, frameworks. And then consequently, um, LGBTI populations are excluded from projects and programs because uh, if you're not in the core document, um, you're not going to be in the response to meet the identified needs. And that really echoed, I guess, from what we're hearing from the organisations we're working with who are saying, we see this as um, we want to do this type of work, but we're not funded to do this type of work. We don't have a way to collect this type of data. We don't know what good practice looks like. There was no guidance been given to them and so consequently they were looking outside of um, uh, the sector I guess uh, the mental health uh, framework to, to try and find answers to that and I guess this document is, is trying to fill that gap now and say okay actually let's see if we can um, fill that um, and so some, some of the key documents, so like the um, National Mental Health Strategy is made up of three key documents. There's the National Mental Health Policy, the fourth National Mental Health Plan, and the Mental Health Statement of Rights and Responsibilities. Um, and it's only the last document that has a, a single inclusion of LGBTI populations. So the, the fourth National Mental Health Plan, um, which sets out uh, what the program's responses look like in a community actually has no inclusion of LGBTI populations at all. So obviously the development of the FISH National Fifth Mental Health Plan is an opportunity um, for us to, to get greater inclusion and visibility of LGBTI populations. Uh, and similarly, the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, which was written um, so uh, sorry to just ask and list those policies again. So yes, the National Mental Health Strategy, so that's made up of three documents, the National Mental Health Policy written in 2008, the fourth, sorry, fourth National Mental Health Plan written in 2009, and the Mental Health Statement of Rights and Respons Responsibilities listed, uh, written in 2012. Hey Sally, um, just to break in, it might be useful yeah. for people to know that if um, they want to refer back to this stuff um, or they've got a copy of the strategy in front of yes. them. Uh, all of these are listed on page 10. Yes, yes, page 10 in the strategy. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm always happy. I um, oddly enough enjoy delving into policy, so I'm always happy to, to, to follow these uh, questions up with emails and stuff as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, similarly, the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, which is the life framework that was written back in 2007, um, only has a single mention of gay and lesbian communities. And I guess just reflecting back to what Ross was just talking about before, often we find that one aspect of our community might be covered. Um, and certainly in the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, we're not seeing the breadth and depth and complexity of LGBTI populations um, represented in these strategies. Um, again, um, th there has been some increasing recognition of, of inclusion um, and certainly one of the key documents that helped drive more inclusion was the Hidden Toll um, Suicide in Australia report, which really highly recommended that there be program responses to LGBTI suicide prevention. Um, and that actually was that report that resulted in the Mind Out project being established and developed. Um, but to date, uh, Mind Out is still the only uh, national mental health um, and suicide prevention strategy uh, program, sorry, looking at LGBTI populations. Um, so we've seen this invisibility roll over again, um, you know, uh, so even some more recent government recommendations on mental health programs, um, LGBTI populations are routine, routinely left out of those documents. Um, so I guess what we, when we were looking at the climate, there was just lots of gaps and lots of invisibility and, and what is that that very much about if um, we're not in the strategy, we're not going to be in the solution. Um, so we just sort of saw this again and again and again. Uh, but if, if people are quite interested in that, uh, page 10 and 11 of the strategy sort of delves into um, which strategies are we included in and which ones are we not in. Um, so I might sort of leave that at that because I could probably keep talking about this for a while. <laughs> Excellent. So. Um, just a, a short follow on from what Sally said, I think both of us were frustrated that uh, when it came to doing that investigative work of how well represented were LGBTI people in, in documents was 
there was just no certainty that that would happen. Um, it felt like some of the older documents do mention our populations and some of the more recent documents don't. And there was very little rhyme and reason as far as we could see about where LGBTI people were included and where they weren't. So as a response to that, this, this document is really um, laying out a, sen a, a sense of strategic principles to make sure that inclusion for LGBTI people um, is at the heart of the way we operate and the way we practice um, as providers of services and as, and as uh, researchers and as policy makers. So this document really hangs on the idea that um, the principles of this document uh, need to be engaged by all levels of uh, providers and researchers and policy makers as a way to ensure what we'll get into a bit later, which is the outcomes of the document. So um, where some of the actions might relate specifically to the kinds of work each of our organisations and our own practice uh, leads us into, as far as we're concerned, these strategic principles underpin uh, the possibility of those actions and outcomes happening. So um, we think that these strategic principles that we'll walk you through in a minute, the, the principles of evidence, intersectionality, access, lived experience, and social inclusion, uh, we think they are not up for grabs, that these really do lay out the best practice uh, landscape for working with LGBTI people. And each of them are as important as the other to make sure that what we're providing uh, for these populations is both uh, suitable, but also best practice as far as intervening in some of those higher rates of both uh, poor mental health and suicide that we've already outlined. Uh, and I'd, I'll be really interested to see if uh, today's audience uh, can understand and, and agree with the, the importance of these principles. So we're actually going to go through each of these principles in depth. I think most importantly, we really didn't want this, these principles just to be simply a, a short list at the beginning of the document that gets read once and, and discarded, that these principles sit underneath each and every one of the actions. Um, so the first of these principles is around evidence. Um, and I guess this was a difficult one for us actually, because when we looked back at what do we know by research, I guess often we know some things, but there's lots of things we didn't know. And so when, when our sector often talks about um, evidence-based practice, sometimes there's a, this uncomfortableness about that because they're going, yes, yes, we do need evidence, but for our communities, there's so much evidence lacking. Um, so very much this um, principle comes around that, that we need more evidence, but this re evidence must be uh, informed by both research, but also from practice, from the work that LGBTI communities have been doing on the ground through our peer delivered, -delivered services. Um, they need to be evaluated, but actually there's a lot of wisdom um, and, and evidence in our communities already. And that is equally as important as the evidence we gain from peer reviewed journals. Um, and so this evidence is what needs to form the foundation of the, the care that's developed to meet the needs of LGBTI populations. But yeah, not just looking at journals to find out what is evidence, but talking to your local communities, what is working in local areas, what's working for particular populations. Um, so very much that's that, the, the principle of evidence. Uh, and the principle, um that I think is quite closely linked to evidence and um, what we're seeing as um, a big sort of organisation that looks at LGBTI health more generally is that of intersectionality. And this may not be a new word to a lot of you who are online today, but it is an emerging word in terms of uh, how frequently it's used. It's certainly something that I've heard around the places uh, around the place for a couple of years now. But the way we use intersectionality here at the Health Alliance is got to do with how the various parts of LGBTI people's identity uh, mix and become a real unique lived experience um, perspective for each one of us. So it's pretty rare to find um, LGBTI people that come from the same background, that have grown up in the same area, that have the same kind of family makeup, that are the same ages. So all of these things, the cultural context that we come from, informs who the LGBTI individual is and zooming back from that, who 
uh, smaller communities of LGBTI people are. So there's this sense that approaching LGBTI as one group of homogenous people is not going to be something that works in terms of a service provision or a research platform. So we hear often uh, that mainstream providers of service, for instance, do uh, what they like to call treating everyone the same. And from their perspective, that means that they're not discriminate, discriminating against people. And that's great. We do applaud that. But what we're encouraging people to think about is that treating everyone the same means that you're missing out on some of these key and very important considerations when it comes to the intersectional life of an individual. And that means that for someone who is LGBTI and going through a mental health crisis or ha having thoughts of suicide, they must be considered in their context. So um, sometimes their identity or their history or their, their narrative as an LGBTI per person might be the key consideration when it comes to interacting with them or including them in research. But it may also be that their, their position as an LGBTI person is not the most important thing to consider when it comes to interacting with that person. Their experience as a migrant might be the most important thing. Their experience as someone who lives outside of a capital city might be the most important thing. Their, uh, their um, considerations must be at, a heart, uh, at the heart of what services can provide for LGBTI. So the um the next, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, so the next uh, principle is around access. Um, I think this was probably quite an easy one for us to include, you know, that, that LGBTI people and communities must receive welcoming and equitable, um, inclusive care. Um, and very much identifying there are still significant structural barriers um, that exist that prevent LGBTI people from receiving equitable and accessible inclusive care, um, including um, exemptions for religious-based organisations, to legally discriminate against LGBT um, people, um, just is one example, I guess, of structural barriers that exist. Um, but also sometimes when uh, LGBTI people don't explicitly see themselves reflected in a service, that, can, it, that invisibility um, also con contributes to the developing of a barrier. And so LGBTI people become more passive in their, um, in, in uh, accessing preventative health and supporting their well-being, so um, access to services um, is a really core part. And for and I guess as as Ross reflecting, um, as LGBTI people are uh, in every other community uh, or identity, so in rural regional areas, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse, they're refugees, they're uh, Aboriginal, and Torres Strait Islander, older people, younger people. Access needs to be across all those other services as well. Um, and going along quite nicely with that is the idea that the lived experience of the LGBTI individual is a really valuable and um, I'd say quite uh, foundational perspective that must be included in the work we're doing. So um, at the heart of this is acknowledging that LGBTI people know their lives better than, than service providers or researchers ever uh, and their voices about what they need and what they have gone through in terms of both the stigma they have experienced, but also the resilience that comes through that stigma that we often hear referred to are really valuable um, contributions to, um, to helping us shape appropriate care and research. So I, I think essentially what we're talking about is that LGBTI people have the right to tell us what they want from a service and what's going to work from, for them. And considering that um, sometimes that services need to work harder to earn the trust of LGBTI people because of their lived experience of uh, structural discrimination or overt discrimination, sometimes even from services. So um, I don't think it's hard to imagine an instance in which an LGBTI person might front up to, say, a health clinic with their guard up because of the way they have been treated by health services in the past. So how would it feel to show up to a health service when you really need it, but to know that your relationship won't be recognised by the care provider or that there's not even a space for you to describe your gender accurately on the intake form? So what we've got to get better at 
is making sure that the needs uh, that exist on multiple levels at the same time for LGBT are not only catered for as far as our services go, but that we're open to hearing from LGBTI, LGBTI people directly about what they need from us and what we can do to make that better. And the, uh, the fifth um, principle that uh, underpins this document is around social inclusion, which again, it was the, the, all these um, principles sort of sit really nicely side by side. Um, and But social inclusion is very much talking about that societies function best when all people uh, feel welcomed and are involved. And so consequently, LGBTI people also really need to be included in the fabric of our society and community. And this is through reducing um, stigma, discrimination, eliminating violence, removing legal barriers that affect the ability of LGBTI people to experience that connection and belonging uh, to, to the broader society. Um, and that sort of is, is really addressing the underlying experiences of stigma, discrimination and so forth that are uh, have a direct impact on the mental health and wellbeing outcomes of LGBTI people. And again, about um, the social inclusion often needs to be explicitly inclusive of LGBTI populations as LGBTI people often are very used to being left out. When we're not explicitly mentioned, there's often the assumption, this, this isn't a place for me. Um, so LGBTI people in broader society need to sometimes be explicitly welcomed um, and especially sometimes in those places where there might have been historic experiences of active discrimination um, from, from, from some places. Um, Sally, I might also too just mention that social exclusion um, can feel like one of those areas of work that we've come such a long way that it's no longer as important as it used to be. But our experience at QLife tells us daily that people feel that their levels of isolation and loneliness as an LGBTI people are still very high. And that discrimination in terms of social exclusion can happen on a daily basis for some people in what we sort of refer to as um, ongoing minority stress. So this idea that it's not necessarily overt discrimination, like getting physically attacked on the street, but it can be someone um, getting on the bus, making a comment to you about how you look or, um, or things that just really mean that LGBTI people's lived experience involves a daily level of stress. Uh, and that's an important consideration. Mm. Um, so connected to that, I'm, I'm hoping that what today's audience and more broadly all of our colleagues, once we get out there and start talking about this strategy um, in our daily work, um, can see that what we've done with the principles framework is lay out the context in which the strategic goals and actions that we'll be walking you through in a minute, the, the landscape in which they can take place effectively. And uh, as you'll see now that we've gone through the principles, I think they're pretty ambitious, but also a, a broad umbrella of the context in which we're hoping action and goals can be achieved. Um, I don't think they're controversial in terms of getting services to sign up with the principles. I think that we all understand that they make up the, the landscape of uh, working best, not only with LGBTI people, but with all people. So it, it sounds funny because I think from this strategy, people expect a really hard and fast list of this is what you can do to be effective with LGBTI people. But actually what we've tried to do is to make it um, a more expansive document than that, and really try to address some of the reasons we think LGBT, LGBTI people are explicitly left out of strategies. So it's a bit more subtle than providing a list of A, B, C, D, walk through it with your client. Uh, but we're hoping that deep, uh, deep sort of consideration and, and interaction with these principles will help the goals we're about to walk you through um, become a reality. So the six goal and, and action areas that we're calling for in the strategy document are around inclusive and accessible care, uh, the evidence data collection and research base uh, that describes LGBTI people, uh, the diversity of the LGBTI population uh, that links back to that lived experience and intersectionality we were talking about, and four, 
that intersectionality and social inclusion stuff itself. Um, five, that we think uh, um, a strategic goal should be a skilled and knowledgeable workforce as far as mental health and suicide prevention is concerned, and also how to promote um, good mental health and prevent um, deaths by suicide as far as uh, LGBTI people are concerned and how we practice our daily work. So to go through each of these uh, strategic goals and actions a bit more in depth. So the first one, inclusive, inclusive and accessible care. Um, really in each of these actually goal areas, uh, the strategy is calling for national leadership acro across this, that actually we only can really achieve inclusive and accessible care when there is a consistent uh, benchmark for the sector to, to work for and to, to work towards and to achieve. Um, and in that, so we're looking for that national guiding about this is the guiding principles. Um, we're looking for um, service arrangements and programs to have explicit um, inclusion of LGBTI populations within those program deliverables. Um, we're looking for exemptions for religious based organisations to be removed. Um, we're looking for these, the, the responses and initiatives and programs to support LGBTI mental health to be adequately resourced. Um, the lack of resourcing for LGBTI initiatives is, is quite a significant barrier for uh, the implementation and delivery of services. So these services need to be resourced and supported. We also need um, initiatives that really specifically target LGBTI populations. And this is echoed throughout the strategy um, where possible for these initiatives to be um, developed, delivered and implemented by um, LGBTI peer-based organisations. So very much around valuing lived experience and peer-led um, spaces. Um, very much about services, again, not this isn't just about the health sector um, developing a response. We're talking about integrated multidisciplinary um, services um, tailoring to meet the specific uh, individual lived experiences of LGBTI people. Um, and very much, I guess, in this, I, I, we'd be particularly keen to see some, um, you know, national standards around what does what does inclusive care look like for LGBTI people? What are the benchmarks? Um, and, and then in there, I guess, uh, really clear uh, expectations for what does this look like. Um, rather than simply a statement, you'll be accessible, but how you do that's up to you. That sense of we actually really need that national leadership and guidance about this is what we expect from our services to be inclusive. Um, and going along with that, there's also uh, a whole collection of actions and goals that we talk about collected under this second category of evidence, data collection and research. And for anyone that does have the document in front of them, uh, we're now looking at page 22. So you can see how expansive um, the calls for action and the specific areas that we think are important for progress uh, are concerned. So we have five broad areas of action uh, that we call for, all connected to the idea of describing LGBTI people and including them in your data set. So as far as my, I'm concerned, this was a bit of a chicken or the egg moment for us because there's a real irony when it comes to data collection because people need uh, guidance around how to do inclusive um, data collection. But until that data is collected, that guidance isn't going to necessarily come through in a way that's clear. So um, what we're calling for is for um, multiple areas in which LGBTI people are included um, when it comes to the collection and um, and research about our own populations. Um, we are calling for the application of the research base that we know exists into contexts that are not just LGBTI uh, specific, um, because we often find that in the LGBTI sort of research landscape is that while there is some data out there, it's cut through into mainstream services is uh, sometimes limited. Um, most importantly, we're calling for a national minimum data set for LGBTI. And this will involve uh, a coordinated approach to make sure that everyone's collecting data in the most, uh, in, in a best practice way. So um, even 
at the LGBTI, uh, National LGBTI Health Alliance. This is a learning curve for us and it changes all the time. But it's important that people um, consider the ways in which gender, for instance, is collected in their clinic setting or in their school setting or in their health setting. Um, uh, and what's really frustrating from a, a national point of view is when um, great data sets, uh, data sets exist that don't align in a way that is useful then for a national picture of what uh, the lived experience of LGBTI people is. Um, this is also frustratingly true on the data set as far as national suicide registries go. Um, something we know is really true for LGBTI people is that the highest time of risk for them in terms of suicide um, is when they themselves have identified as an LGBT. Um, I is a little bit different, but how they have identified as an LGBT person uh, but have not disclosed that status of being LGBT to anyone else. So um, we know that if that person dies by suicide, they will not be recorded um, as an LGBT person um, who has died by suicide because they are no longer here to tell us about that. So um, we're not saying that uh, our calls for data collection will solve that problem, but a uniform and standard approach to reporting around deaths by suicide is really important. Um, above and beyond that, we are calling for the government funding of initiatives to help people get their data into a sort of state that we consider uh, best practice and usable. Uh, and along with that, uh, a, a development of a best practice around intake for um, LGBTI people so that when they're approaching care and approaching uh, a setting in which they're getting some help, um, they know what to expect and they know how to describe their gender and their relationship status and their sexuality in a way that's going to be useful for their care. It's not about being intrusive in terms of disclosure, but it's about making sure that the care that they can get uh, can be as best suited to their needs as possible. Um, we're calling for increased and consistent commitment to better research across the country. And we are most impressed by the, the researchers already out there in the landscape doing this work. Uh, but we think that a national approach and commitment to researching LGBTI populations will help those researchers that are already doing the work do it better and encourage more people to participate in LGBTI research. And we also are calling for a national uniform approach to the evaluation of LGBTI programs, but also of mainstream programs in terms of their appropriateness for LGBTI people. So the idea of a, a minimum expectation that if you're working in a mental health or suicide prevention space about what you need to be doing to become in terms of care. Did and I so, cover everything then, Sally? Was there anything I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Look, actually, I think um, evidence and data collection is really an interesting space, actually. It's very um, complex. It is complex. And, and I guess what we're seeing at the moment is we have organisations who are, are going, I want to do LGBTI work better, and they're starting to develop their own ways and mechanisms of, develop, of collecting data, which is actually, for me, really quite exciting because we then start to actually fill some of these gaps mm. about answering the question, um, how many LGBTI people are accessing um, mental health and suicide prevention services? Um, but what's happening when people start to collect this data is really hard to compare them because how they collect them, the types of questions they ask, who they ask are all different. And so when we're starting to look at data, um, it is really difficult to compare it. Um, and so I think it is really important to have that sort of national um, uh, standards but I think again this is a question that we're still answering about what does good data collection look like um, what is best practice around data collection and and I know that's a question we're often asked at the National LGBTI Health Alliance and often my answer still is <clears throat> I don't know um, and this is probably a question that needs to be answered in really broad consultation with the, the diversity of our community about how do we best capture our experiences our identities our histories in, 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 um, in data so I think this is a, a really big unknown question, but a question that, that really needs to be answered and explored properly. Um, and for me, it's quite an exciting space to be delving into. 
Yeah. And I think actually that really goes on really nicely, I guess, onto the, the next goal um, in the strategy, which is really looking at the diversity uh, within and between and underneath our LGBTI community. Um, we be very clear in the in this document that we're not saying there's a single response that an organisation can implement to meet the needs of LGBTI people, because um, you know the LGBTI community is made up of people with diverse bodies, diverse relationships, diverse genders, diverse sexualities, um, with a range of histories, a range of identities, a range of experiences. And uh, strategies and approaches really need to in take into account the specific needs of different subpopulations, but also the different needs of, uh, of people at an individual level that might be quite unique. Um, this strategy we break down to look specifically at people with intersex characteristics, transgender people and bisexual people. Uh, generally within our LGBTI population, these are groups of people uh, often that are very invisible, or often what we describe as being conflated. Um, so what we mean is that they are all chucked in together. Um, and the assumption being that a transgender person's experience is going to be the same as a lesbian woman's experience. So it's where everything's just all muddled in together. Uh, and this happens a lot in, in research, in programs, in even how we talk about our community. Uh, so this goal was really attempted to unpack that and to really identify that the needs, uh, support needs of different parts of a community will need different responses. Um, and but in 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 each of these areas also with these these subpopulations, um, we're really identifying that peer led responses are still really important. So people, intersex people leading initiatives for people with intersex characteristics, transgender communities leading initiatives for transgender people, bisexual people leading initiatives for bisexual people. Um, so it's not about um, gay and lesbian services or people trying to find responses to meet the needs of people with intersex characteristics. So they're very different lived experiences. Um, so and, and very much also that there, there may need to be specific program and policy responses that address these particular subpopulations as well. Um, uh, uh, intersex people's experiences with um, medicalisation and surgical interventions will have different experiences. Transgender people's need to negotiate the, the medical system to gain access to transition support will have different impacts. Um, so, so very much that there, there might be need to be really specific responses to um, specific subpopulations. And that's really what this that goal is really attempting to do is break down what this is, um, but again, really coming back to it does really also depend. It might be what happens at a local level might be quite different. Is there anything else, Ross, that you might want to reflect on? Um, no, but I will link it through to the next concept, which is around intersectionality and social inclusion. Just I'm quite conscious of time, so sure. uh, let's whip through these last action areas and um, do a summary. But uh, I think that. Really what Sally was saying there about LGBTI populations, we really explore in greater depth in the strategy document for all sorts of other intersectionalities for LGBTI people too. So while it might be comfortable to say LGBTI, it's about being aware that sometimes you're only actually referring to LGB people because you're talking about sexuality. You're not actually talking about gender and you're certainly not talking about intersex. Um, and that can be true for the other elements and dimensions, as Lee just said in a comment about the individual lived experience of an LGBTI person. So when you're describing gay and lesbian people, are you actually describing gay and lesbian people with a disability as well? Are you actually describing gay and lesbian people who come from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds? Uh, and if you're not, do you have a need to consider that context in the work you do? Because the people that you're working with come from backgrounds that need to be considered. Uh, and we think that that kind of inclusion from both a research and service level can only feed into good social inclusion uh, and populations. And we explore that uh, in some depth in the document. Uh, and as Sally already said, we're both very happy to take individual uh, questions about this if you want to email it through later. Um, but going on from um, the, the concept of the individual, it, there is this duality of also needing to the individual within their 
community status, however they define that for themselves. And I think just on that, uh, what was interesting when looking at other strategies that were developed for other populations, so for example, looking at the National um, Indigenous Mental Health or Suicide Prevention Strategy, again, in these strategies, LGBTI populations were always invisible. Um, so very rarely was intersectionality with those other populations identified. So it was really important for us in our strategy to identify that. Um, because as uh, you said before, yeah. Sally, LGBTI people come from every other Australian context. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next uh, action area is around having a skilled and knowledgeable workforce. Again, I think this one for uh, this was quite a simple one for us to include. Um, the better trained, the better knowledgeable, the better skilled, the more confident a workforce is around working with LGBTI people, the, the more able they are to meet the support needs of LGBTI people in their care. Um, and this is this has probably been happening a lot. Um, a lot of services services and organisations are engaging in professional development and training. So this is this is, happens a lot across the space. What the strategy is probably really looking for is um, standard competencies, um, access to training, resources to support the professional development of our workforce. Um, for resources that already exist to be made available to the sector. Um, uh, for, for, for service providers to be aware of what's already out there um, in ways that they've not, it's been very ad hoc um, and based mostly on what's uh, an organisation's um, focus. So really making this more um, standardised across our sector. Absolutely. And the, the final area of goal and action that we're calling for is the way in which you promote uh, good mental health and suicide prevention and how you um, prevent people from, LGBTI people from getting to the place where they need care in the first place. So I appreciate we've run through these actions really quickly. Um, when you spend some time with the document, you'll see that what, what Sally and I have just attempted to do is run through over 50 areas that we think are really important for intervention when it comes to working with LGBTI people. So um, I do encourage you to spend some time with the document becoming familiar with this detail. Because in a way, that's prevention too, like making it that you are familiar with the context in which we've just described and the best practice principles that we've just described is possibly the best thing you can do when interacting with LGBT. And making sure that we have adequate um, resourcing for specific promotion of good mental health and suicide prevention for LGBTI people, we go into in some detail, but it's a critical and underpinning uh, act of the other six, uh, the other five goal areas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is actually probably really quite important, the promotion and prevention stuff, because we are quite aware of the factors that do cause poor mental health. We know that stigma, discrimination, exclusion, isolation contribute to poor mental health and increase the risk of suicide. For future generations, if we can address that, hopefully we can interrupt um, the, the rates of, of poor mental health and suicide in our community in, in the long term. Um, so this, um, this is a, a huge document that we've been working on and I know we've just given you a really quick tour of it, but it actually it's been really quite exciting to actually walk through it um, a bit more in depth. Um, this has been recorded, so you can share this with your colleagues. Uh, the strategy is available for download on our website, and we're actually also posting out hard copies to anyone who, who would like, like one. Um, and, and over the next probably uh, several months, uh, we're really going to be focused on implementation. So there's going to be other webinars. Um, it's really sort of a stay tuned um, to see what else will be happening both online, but maybe also in local areas as well. Um, so on the last slide, we've actually have set up an email strategy at lgbtihealth.org.au. So if you're after some physical copies of the strategy, if you have any questions about the strategy, about how do we start to implement this in a, in a local context, please touch base. Um, the Actually, just on the previous slide, there was also that resource. Uh, we've created a poster resource that goes with this um, strategy um, and one of the, the questions uh, people often ask what's a really simple thing I can do to create a more welcoming environment often we talk about visible representation so we've actually developed our a poster that people can utilize in a very simple way to give a message of an inclusive space mindful though that 
uh, inclusive care is much, much more than just a poster on the wall. Yep. Um, and if you're going to put the poster up, it, it requires walking the walk. Yes, that's right. That's right. So it's just one of those, it's, a, it's like a little first step that you can take. Um, so please feel free to touch base with us. Um, we really appreciate, I know we've run out of time, but if anyone did have a question, if you want to stay online um, to, to type a little question, please, we're happy to hang around for a few minutes, but also mindful that people want to probably get back to their afternoons. Um, so thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you, Ross, for this conversation about this strategy. Oh, thank you, Sally. Yeah, no, it's been really great. Um, so actually, and just a reminder, next week, uh, we have our normal Network Mind Out webinar here next Tuesday with Delaney Skerritt, uh, actually going through some of some amazing research we have around LGBT, LGBT suicide uh, in Australia. So this is some of the research we refer to in this strategy and, and has really um, guided our, our work in this space. Um, so thank you very much. I don't think there's any big questions that have come through, but um, please feel to touch base and we'll see you next time. Cool. So thank you.